also, this meeting is being recorded um, to, um, this, be, this meeting is being recorded uh, and to say for those folks who cannot attend tonight. Thank you, Ming. Hi, everyone, welcome. Um, I will give just a couple more minutes to make sure we have everyone joining. Feel free to leave your name um, and where you're from in the chat. We have a great panel tonight and we are excited to get started. So I'll probably start in about a minute or so. Okay, so we're at 7.05 and we want to make sure that uh, we have time for all of the questions and um, our panelists can then answer questions at the end of the panel, so I will get started. Thank you all for joining tonight. Um, we've gathered some amazing social workers in the room to share their stories, their advice, um, on the path that they chose after, their, after earning their MSW degree. Um, we hope that this educates and inspires everyone, whether you're in a degree program currently, um, those who have already graduated, or those just curious about really what can you do with an MSW. Um, as Ming mentioned, I'm co-facilitating with him. My name is Lauren Walsh. I use pronouns she, her. I am a non-traditional student with a background, a professional background in communications, but I am in my last semester of my MSW degree at Stony Brook University. And we also have our colleague, Kelly, who will be manning the chat. Kelly, did you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Hi, folks. My name is Kelly Madden. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a part-time online, also non-traditional student at the University at Buffalo. Um, just want to say if you have any questions, concerns, or even a tech issue throughout the chat tonight, feel free to message me um, individually as well if you need to, and I'm happy to help. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce our lovely panelists. Um, we have Veronica Cruz, LMSW. She currently serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff for the youngest woman elected to New York State Senate and the first Democratic Socialist voted into state office. We also have Elisa Kim, LMSW, a remote therapist who enjoys working with perinatal, adolescent, and geriatric populations. Her practice is centered around trauma-focused and strength based and person-centered approaches. Additionally, we have Jamie White, LMSW. She works on a neurobehavioral unit at a nursing home in Rochester, New York. Jamie graduated with her master's in social work in 2019 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And prior to pursuing her master's degree, she re received a bachelor's degree in public health in 2015 from Ithaca College. Thank you so much to each of you for joining us. Ming, let's get started. So my first question to my lovely panelists is, um, why did you decide to pursue social work and what is your area of practice? Um, Veronica, would you like to go first? I had a relative that was a social worker um, and he was a clinical social worker and I was inspired by the work that he was doing and decided that looked right for me. Thank you. Alisa? 
Um, I, I was also a non-traditional student when I returned um, back to grad school, first school. I graduated from undergrad and I wrote it down because it's so long ago in 2006. And I was in digital media for about 10 years. And I decided I wanted to change careers and shift gears into something more meaningful and a career that I felt like would grow with me. Um, and I talked to a lot of people who were therapists because that's what I really wanted to do. And I never considered or knew what um, MSWs and LMSWs could do. And after talking to a bunch of folks, um, led me to grad school and I graduated in 2020. Thank you. And last but not least, Jamie. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, I actually knew the population that I wanted to work with. Um, when I graduated with my undergrad, I didn't really know about social work, but one of my professors um, in undergrad told me about it. And I um, met a social worker in a nursing home and just decided that I'd do that because I really wanted to work in a nursing home with the geriatric population. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, my second question is, describe your day-to-day -day at work. What does engagement, assessment, intervention, and evaluation look like in your role? Um, anyone can go. I can go first. Um, so I work from home for a remote company. My previous job was in person and hybrid, so it looked a little bit different, but I work eight hour shifts every day. And um, today was my late day, which means I end at six. So I see about at the most seven clients a day. Um, and depending on you know, the day, it can be as little as three to seven. Today I saw seven, so it was a big day. Um, so I do 45 minute sessions normally. Um, and the intake coordinator does all of the initial paperwork, but we do a formal comprehensive assessment and evaluation in the first appointment. And then moving forward, we do weekly appointments and then we move to biweekly if appropriate. Um, the amount of assessment and paperwork and the notes are all different from agency to agency, but because this is a, um, remote company and we don't operate under OMH. So my assessment work is a lot lighter here. Um, I can go. So um, like they said, I work on a neural behavioral unit in a nursing home. Um, so it's right now currently 19 residents who have um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and they have um, challenging behaviors that um, are related to their dementia. Um, so obviously in a nursing home, you're kind of at the mercy of the New York State Department of Health. So a lot of what we do, um, the required assessments are um, per DOH. Um, so we do cognitive assessments quarterly, we do depression screens. Um, but I'm lucky in that I have the smallest caseload, so I have a lot of time to be out on the floor assisting the residents. A lot of them need one-to-one -to, -one to support. Um, you know, some of my coworkers have upwards of 72 people on their caseload, so they don't have a lot of time to spend with the residents. Um, I hold care plan meetings with families every three months. Um, I do hospice meetings um, if someone needs to sign on to hospice. Um, and then I also work 10 hours in admissions. So not really social work, but I um, kind of look at hospital charts and help bring people in for short-term rehab, so. Veronica? Yeah, I can jump in here. And my day is a little different. First, a big shout out to everyone from all the different schools. Always love when Buffalo's around, Syracuse, Albany, and the downstate uh, schools. It's uh, great to have all of you um, so enthusiastically join in. Thank you so much for um, making this all possible. Uh, my day is a little different from Alyssa and Jamie's in that it deals more with larger groups. So for example, if we were going to discuss what assessment, intervention, and evaluation is, 
for me, it would be um, the assessment would be the pulse, right? And you take that in government, in the legislature, by the people that come through. So who are the, what's happening in the communities? What's happening in the topic areas? Then, of course, the intervention is the legislation that your member puts forth. And then the evaluation can be seen as the effective way you are able to successfully get legislation through, or at least to bring a lot of attention to it. So for now, for example, my day today was in large part talking and contemplating where bail reform would go or where discovery was going to go and where the legislature, both houses and the governor would come to an agreement because right now uh, the budget is stalled because of it. So my day is going to a presser. You have a large press conference with advocates that are saying no, no rollbacks to bail reform, none to discovery. Then you have groups coming through, you have demonstrations. And so um, you're part of all of that that's happening. Thank you for your answers. It's so interesting to see despite you come from different fields, um, we all as social workers apply micro and macro, macro skills in different settings. And my next question is, what was it like jumping into your first full-time role after you graduate? And do you have any tips about that transition process? I can go first. Um... So I graduated in 2019. I spent a couple months. So I was out in Wisconsin. I came back to New York. Um, that's where I'm from and spent a couple months on Indeed. I was trying to informally um, meet people that maybe knew social workers and settings. Um, so I got a job. It was important to me to work somewhere where there were other social workers that I could learn from. Unfortunately, the job offer that I got didn't have a social worker there. Um, so I, I just did what I could based on my education. Um, but I would say that my tip would be to find a job where there's um, social workers that work there or build your own informal network. Um, find like pages on Facebook with social workers in the area um, or join the local chapter, or whatever you need to do to, to make sure you have that support. Um, Cause I was, it was kind of baptism by fire, but I did it. <laughs> so. I can jump in here. Um, my first, um, what was that like? My first job going into the field, uh, you know, like Jamie, I really didn't know many people. I had, I went to school in Kansas. So from Kansas, I came to upstate New York and what I was really lucky and fortunate was landing a field internship that turned out really well for me. So when my field internship was coming to an end, the supervisor said, hey, I have this program in this town that's probably about 45 minutes, almost an hour away from here, further upstate. And he said, I'm looking for a program director and you would be ideal for it. And that was so great because from there, I learned uh, the beginning processes of managing contracts, state contracts, city contract, or rather county contracts. And that proved very fruitful for me because from there, I went on to found a nonprofit that is still very large and still exists today in that location. Um, it was very unusual to find this Puerto Rican girl in this uh, going you know, further up, uh, up the throughway at that time, but um, it, it was actually quite an experience, but it was that field internship that made such a big difference for me. Yeah, I think your internship experience really is super important and um, not only, you know, getting experience, but also making some connections. And that's how I got my first job as well. I ended my internship and they offered me a um, part-time job while I was finishing up my degree. And then they offered me a full-time job once I completed 
Um, but this was right where COVID was starting and we were all under lockdown. So I started as a remote therapist at home, which was really hard and isolating and challenging because I didn't know what I was doing. I'm still learning and it felt it was really difficult. And then once we started to open back up, I was doing hybrid there. So I think making connections with your supervisors, the coworkers that you meet in your internship are super important, but also, um, you know, each other at school, meeting other students who are also in field. I still talk to my friends who I was really close to because we did our first field internship together. And while that experience, um, you know, was really challenging, we are still talking about job opportunities that come up or challenges that we have. So it's a really good support system. Thank you for all those wonderful advice. Um, my next question is, what is the importance of mentorship to you? And who do you consider your mentors, either formal or informal, are or were in different life stages as a student or in your job field? Any tips on approaching a person who you would like to be a mentor? I think you should just ask them. Um, when I was looking to change jobs, I just cold emailed 15 different therapists in my area who were doing work that I thought was really interesting. And I think over 90% of them replied and they made time for me and we met in person, we talked on the phone and everybody was so kind and generous. So while it wasn't a long-term mentorship, if you wanna meet somebody and have an interesting story that you wanna hear, just reach out. Jamie, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I would say that, so there's four other long-term care social workers at the nursing home I work at, and they're all a bit older than me, and they all have a lot of experience, so I kind of see all of them as my mentors. I know I can go to them with any questions or challenges that I'm having, um, but when I was in school, definitely my internship supervisors um, I did an internship in a skilled nursing facility, so got to really learn the job that I wanted to do one day. Um, and then my second internship, I actually um, was at the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. They have a state dementia specialist, so I got to do more macro level work, which then in that type of work, I thought maybe I want to do that instead of working with individuals. So um, she was a, a big mentor for me. So. Yeah, I think mentorships are super, super important and they can make a really big difference for you. So like Alisa, my mentor was that my field advisor who said, you know, I really think this would be a great move for you and this would be a great opportunity for you. And I take student, you know, MSW students at my site and they have the benefit there of meeting so many other people because it's such government is so big. And so there they move around and they find mentors. But I just want to say that try to think, you know, when I think of mentors, it doesn't need to be so traditional, especially as you move on in your career, your mentor might be someone that you admire or you admire their work. And there's someone you want to work with a little more so that you can get to know their style, begin to network with them, begin to forge uh, working relationships that can be very much like mentorships, but in a different kind of way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mentorship um, comes in different shapes and form, and that also comes down to our social work value with human relationships and to see the different kind of uh, relationships and lessons we can learn from each other. My next question is, how do you reconcile your role, function, and purpose in your job with social work values of social justice and advocacy? Eliza, would you want to go first? Sorry to call on you. 
Um, I feel like this was really important to me, especially when I was working in community mental health. I was working in a really impoverished area where there were a lot of people struggling. Um, so every day it was focusing on advocating for our clients, focusing on providing resources or even working with our administration to talk about what, what more can we do. So even though we were just mental health therapists, it felt like we were doing so much more and a lot of community building. Um, I think there's definitely a lack of resources that are available for a therapist to be in that capacity, but I loved working in that community. It was very, very challenging, um, but it's, Every single day, it can be as little as just showing up for our clients and talking to them about how to advocate for themselves and also working on bigger community projects. You know, I think that's a really great question. And if you wouldn't mind, I just want you to, if you could just ask it one more time. I think that's a super important question. Yeah, definitely. Um, the question is, how do you reconcile your role, function, and purpose in your job with social work values of social justice and advocacy? It's such a great question because I think sometimes we assume some things about ourselves as social workers. We assume that we all think the same, that we the social justice means the same thing to all of us, that we all see um these different notions of reform from a from a similar perspective and i think nothing can be further from the truth and even when you're working in what might be considered a very progressive area you still can you still will reconcile what you feel is right with sometimes what you feel uh, what you need to do so, for example, when you work in government and you work for a member, you might not always agree with every one of their platforms. And so it might come into conflict with a personal belief. Um, and so you, you're constantly recon reconciling that. And that's okay. I think that's super okay. We try to, I try to minimize having to do that reconciliation. So, for example, I run campaigns. So if I'm going to run a campaign for a candidate, I'm going to make sure that we agree on one, two, and three. And if we're good on one, two, and three, four, five, and six doesn't bother me. It's the same thing when you work for a member. You don't agree with everything. And in fact, you may, you may find that something that might be considered uh, socially just is really not socially just from a person of color's perspective. So, but you say, okay, one, two, three, I'm good. Four, five, maybe not so good, but it's all about the weight and how much weight you put on those things that you value as a social worker from a professional point of view, from our code of ethics, and then from our own code of ethics that we carry. I love that. Definitely. It's a difficult thing sometimes, I think, for everyone in, in every kind of avenue of social work, but it's a great point, Veronica. Jamie, did you want to answer this one? I don't know that I can follow that up. <laughs> um, I think I, <laughs> I think I do a lot of, um, like individual advocacy. So I work with people with dementia who oftentimes can't express their needs or can't advocate for themselves. Um, so I work with the families and, and try and advocate for them. And um, yeah, I mean, the whole team that I work with does a lot of advocacy for the residents. So I feel supported, like, you know, they're with me. I'm not working against the doctors or the nurses or anything like that. So Great. Okay, I think um, we're gonna switch a little bit and I'll start asking some questions. We have a few more to go. I really appreciate everyone's perspective. I think um, having 
you in you're in different roles and just hearing your different perspectives is is great for everyone Tr kind of trying to figure out what to do right with our msw so um I will throw out, so the next question is, do you have any tips for new graduates looking for a social work job? Where do you look? Ways to approach the job search? Um, everything is ever changing. Is it LinkedIn? Do you contact someone via email? Um, do you have any tips for us? A lot of us are graduating soon or thinking about going into a program. Um, sharing any tips you have on uh, for new graduates. Elisa, maybe? <laughs> um, I started looking before I graduated with my field placement because the second year at my school, we can pick our placement. And I knew that was going to be really important for me in order to make connections and potentially secure a job, which is what ended up happening, which was so lucky. Um, but I usually look at all the all the places I'm sure you guys all know about already, like Indeed, ZipRecruiter, or just Googling. But then I'll also look um, on Facebook groups. A lot of people talk about companies they like, companies that they're inspired by, or even companies where they talk about, I have a really great therapist and she works for this agency. So I'll just bookmark those, even if they're looking for um, LCSWs, which I'm not licensed for yet, but I'll have that bookmarked in case um, they are hiring when I am available. Um, I also do a lot of emailing to folks, and I really think you should be writing um, really personalized cover letters, um, tailoring your resume, all of that is really important. Um, and even if you're doing blind, um, things through the recruiter or indeed still like focusing and telling all of the stuff you mail out and then reaching out to your old supervisors, your old professors, even your um, student, other students in the class to hear about what their experience has been like if they're hiring. So you have a lot of resources at your fingertips right now that you probably are overlooking, but um, just ask around, start your networking. Love that. Um, Jamie, did you have anything? Um, I mean, I would just say I applied to some jobs that were definitely outside of my comfort zone when I graduated, just because I wasn't finding a job in, in the population I wanted to work with. Um, but I think just going on those interviews and learning like what you're looking for in a job or in an organization um, and getting familiar with the questions that people might ask you, um, definitely the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. <laughs> And so I would just jump in and say, like, I think it's important to have a visual presence, the LinkedIn, the, um, you know, especially in your last year, your field placement, if you can drop pictures, Instagram, you know, any kind of account that lends legitimacy to you, you're the product, you are really what you're selling, you're the package. And so you want to show people why bringing you on as part of their team is so important. But I think one of the, you know, it's, everyone is going to go, for example, who's into criminal justice is going to apply at the Vera Institute. They're going to go to the Brennan Center. They're going to go to RAP. They're going to go to the traditional organizations because they're great places and who wouldn't want to work there. But I think one of the, 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 the most interesting thing I heard someone say on a panel was, take the road less traveled. Sometimes you take a job that you think you're not going to get anything from, and it's amazing what will happen. So I have a, a student who, she when she left my office, she took a job in codes. Many people would say codes is where, is, is a place where maybe people go to die. I don't know. It, it's a place in, in government where you're coding things. And so she said she was forever known as the code girl until she saw a, uh, an assembly session in which she saw the social worker speak. And she said she was so inspired by the way they spoke. And that's what made her decide that she was going to go to um, 
get an MSW. From there, she went on. She was a communications major, still working in communications. But when you take the road less traveled, you don't know where you're gonna, it's going to take you. But that can sometimes be the best part. Yes, yes to that. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Um, we have a few other questions. One would be, tell us about a time when you recognize success in your role or field. Like, what does that look like to you and how, how did that feel? Anyone can hop in. Do you mean personally or as a industry? Um, it could be either, like um, depending on what your role is. So was there any any time you realized as in private practice that you felt like, okay, I'm doing I'm doing the good work, like this is why I'm doing it. Like what does success kind of mean to you in the role that that you do in your in your social work fields? Mm, I see. Um, I think for me, it's mostly um, client interactions and the responses and sessions that I hold with clients, because sometimes it can be really challenging. But when I hear, um, hear them tell me their wins for the week, or hear them talk so proudly about the changes they're seeing, or the improvements they're seeing in themselves, um, that's amazing. I also love working with teens and kids who go from, I hate being in therapy, I'm not doing this, to now I have to cut them off because we've gone over an hour and it's been way too long and we have to wrap it up. And it feels so good to say, wow, this kid really trusts me and he's learning and he's working on himself so much um, and building that rapport. So just my relationships with my client are so um, important. And you know that's where I really feel like I feel like I'm making a difference. Um, and that doesn't happen every day, but when it does, it's amazing. Thank you. Jamie or Veronica? I'll jump in. Um, I think success is a little different in the macro world than it is it for Alyssa and Jamie, right? So they can, they're actually seeing their success and they're interacting with their success. But as, as a manager, you're, you're interpreting and you're assessing success very differently. And even though your success is very impactful, you don't see it immediately. But what I love about it is it's generational and it is long lasting. You never meet the people that you help, but you know they're there and they're in the thousands. And so success is measured a little differently. How you feel it is different because in the macro world, the team is everything. Success is defined not just by yourself, but by your team. Success is also defined not by the things that have your name on them, but the things that you know you did that had this impact. So, and I'll give you an example. I was in a meeting the other day and this, uh, we were in the team, it was a caucus meeting. And someone said, you know, what we're doing right now when we write our sponsors memos is we are including a social justice impact statement. So if you've ever seen a legislative memo, it has a fiscal impact, it has the summary, but it never really addresses the social justice impact, the rectification that you're making for the reason why this bill is being done. And so what I did in our office was I said, you know what, we're going to do a social impact. We're going to talk about why this bill is so important, informed consent. And define it in terms of the number of women that will not die because they don't know the lives that will be saved. But in this meeting, this one guy said, you know, we're going to start doing that. We've seen that done in this office. 
And it was the office I work in. And it was something that came out of a conversation that I was having with the team. And I said, let's move forward this way with our sponsors and MOs. And so here you are in a meeting um, and the, this other to totally different caucus is taking on what you started. Do they know me? Do all these people know me? No, will I meet half of them? Probably never. But that's the type of impact that you have. So you don't get to, you don't get the benefit of seeing it, but you know it's very powerful. You know it's multi generational, and you know it has such a large ripple effect. Thank you. That's that's awesome. Jamie, did you want to share? Yeah, I think my experience is similar to Elisa. Um, just you know, putting a smile on one of my residents' faces or giving them a hug um, or being able to help them through a, a behaviorally challenging time when maybe other people are, you know, not able to and a familiar face can help. Um, but it's actually not in the work that I do, but I've been able to just in what I've learned in the last four years, help with both my grandmothers um, just like navigating the elder care system, placing them in assisted living facilities. So um, being able to like be the support to all of my aunts and uncles and cousins who need um, questions answered or need, um, you know, just support to like understand dementia or how to deal with grandma um, has taught me that I've definitely learned a lot in the field that I can share, so. Yes. I, I can relate to that. <laughs> I had a grandfather um, who, who's passed now, but it, it's a difficult system to navigate. And I think that like our skills, both in the work, um, obviously are important, but outside as well in our own personal life. So thank you for sharing that. Um, the next question is, um, have you ever felt imposter syndrome in the workplace? And how have you managed and addressed this knowing that you have the education and you have the experience. I think, especially as students, we, we think about this a lot. And so any, um, anything you can share on imposter syndrome with us? Veronica, did you wanna share first? Yeah, I can jump in. I am. Um... I was um, running a uh, nonprofit and executive director, and I was tapped to work in the governor's office as a six, assistant secretary for health and human services. And I remember at that time thinking, oh my God, how am I going to pull this off? I mean, talk about clicky heels three times. That was a definite clicky heel three times moment. But, you know, what, do you, what are the alternatives? Not to do it. So I'm good. Uh, I was good with impostering, improvising. Another way of uh, thinking about it is improvisation and going with it. And then it all works out. Totally all works out. Yeah, pushing through that fear, right? I think. Um, Jamie or Elisa? I think it was really helpful for me to think about um, my role as a therapist as something that I know I'm going to be growing and learning for the rest of my life. And I still, every day something comes up and I'm like, oof, I need to look this up or I need to talk to my supervisor about this later. And that's really important. You have so much support in your agencies. Um, and there's so many people who know what that feels like, who know how to support you. You just need to ask for it. And it's always okay to say, I'm not sure. Um, and then go back and explore that further because you're just human. Um, I had my first appointment a couple of months ago who is a client who is also a therapist. And that was really hard for me. Um, so that took a lot of work to get through my stuff because now I felt so so on the spot and felt like, oh my gosh, she's going to know more than me, or how am I going to help another therapist? So I think it's a really amazing learning opportunity. And I love being a lifelong student. And I love that I get to train all the time. So I think it's a good thing. I like that perspective. 
Jamie? Um, I mean, all the social workers at work joke that we all have imposter syndrome and some of them have been working for 25 years, 30 years in the field. Um, I have kept like emails or letters from family members just like thanking me for the work that I did because I think on days where you're like I don't know what I'm doing I can't do this um referring back to those helps you realize that you are making a difference um so holding on to those types of things that is a great idea <laughs> thank you um, okay, a couple more questions we have, and then of course we'll go to everyone um, on the Zoom. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, or we can also call on you. Um, how do you practice self-care as a social work professional? Um, you can define that how, how you choose, right? So does anyone have, um, would anyone like to go first in terms of self-care? Um, I think you should keep really good boundaries around your work hours because um, it's really easy for those hours to bleed into the night and you don't need to be working at nine o'clock. So if my work hour is from eight to four, I try to keep to that limit unless, of course, something happens and I have to take some time to finish some notes that will happen. But for the most part, I try to keep to my work hours and I try to leave um, the second I'm done with my work. I shut down my laptop or I even do like a small ritual of closing out all my tabs to make it seem like I'm leaving the office because I'm just leaving the room. So just have really good rules and boundaries for yourselves. Very important. Jamie? Yeah, I mean, I think at work, I tend to prioritize things. So if I have a call from a family member, and it's not very urgent, and I don't need to call them back, I think like I wait to, for a time where I'm ready to make that call. So I'm, you know, the best me to make that call. Um, but yeah, I think just continuing to do things in your personal life that make you happy. Um, I have a dog, I wish he was here, but he would have disrupted the whole thing. So um yeah, my dog helps going to the gym, all the things that you love to do, just continue to do them. I'm not good with that question. So I'm just going to admit it, that that is a truth. You know, there are three truths about me. One, I am super, super shy. Two, I cannot, I no self-care is, is really something that I think social workers struggle with. And so, especially in, uh, you know, when you're doing the advocacy part of social work, because it's like 24 hours, people are calling you, you know, it, it's always, it's always on. So it really is a constant battle. And I really, I, I think that's where Alyssa and Jamie, for example, the advice that they've given is very, is very good um, to really practice, you know, the things that are important to you and to make those priorities and to really have those boundaries. But it can be hard it, when you're in the macro world. It's a little more challenge. It is challenging. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so another question we have, since we do have a lot of students, um, and at least, as you said, we're all lifelong students. So, hey, here we are. <laughs> um, but what are you excited to see from a fresh uh, kind of cohort of graduates in the social work profession? Like, what excites you about a new generation of social workers? Um, I hate when people say that's just the way things have been done or they're reluctant to change because they're just used to it or scared to change. Um, so I love when new people come to the agency, whether it's new graduates or just recent hires who see a problem and they say, that's not okay, we shouldn't settle for that. And I love hearing new ideas and fresh perspectives. So I'm really excited to see how different things are going to look in just five, 10 years. Jamie, what do you think? 
Oh, I had the same answer, like fresh eyes, a good, you know, a new perspective, um, good energy. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Just, just incredible. Just, you know, really the, so enthusiastic about the profession and the profession is so, um, it's hard to know how well prepared we are to really receive that and to let all that in because there's so much that this new court cohort of social workers is bringing to the profession. You know, hopefully we're all, you know, welcoming, welcoming them, welcoming of their thoughts, their perspectives, their different approach to social work. Awesome, thank you. Um, I will just ask, I know um, in terms of, we touched on it a bit, but I think um, if you have anything additional to share in terms of, you know, coming from, I know Elisa, you mentioned you came from a digital communications background, like coming from a different background into the field um, in terms of applying to jobs, looking for them, keywords, like kind of into the nitty gritty of how you kind of search um, because we're all on these platforms, but sometimes if you don't know what, what you're looking for, like it's hard to find it, right? So um, each of you, if you have any advice on like, if we are looking to be a campaign manager, if we are looking to go into private practice, are there any more specific um, tips you have for us for, for searching for those positions online, in person, et cetera? So when I was starting to look, I just looked for LMSW because before COVID was a thing, it was very, very hard to find remote jobs for LMSW. They only they were only really hiring LCSWs, and it's still not super, super common for LMSWs for a fully remote job. But that's a keyword that works for me. Um, but the other thing that I do sometimes is I'll just Google remote therapy, and I'll find companies, um, and I'll look at their website, see what that company's like, what their mission statements like, who's working there. And then if that aligns with what I want to do and what I believe, what my values are, then I'll look at their career page and see if they're hiring too. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Anyone else want to share? Or we can also go to questions from the chat. I know, Kelly, you've been monitoring. Um, and everyone else, feel free to raise your hand as well. Nicole? Hi, thank you everyone for sharing. I'm very curious about this idea of pushing back in a professional setting. So you all kind of touched on it a little bit, this idea of um, making good trouble, right? Like working within the systems that we're in that really perpetuate a lot of the problems that we face. But what, and and then like also getting pushback, right? We get a lot of pushback. We're told, stay in your lane. Like, don't ask those questions, be quiet. What would you recommend is the best way to, to push back in a professional way? Was that for anyone in particular or everyone? Everyone, anyone. Nicole, that was a great question, but I just want to make sure I understand it. So if you wouldn't mind just asking it again. Yeah. So how can we push back about basic, you know, like policies and procedures that are implemented within our organizations that are um, maybe dated or don't make any sense or are just matter-of-factly oppressive towards the people that we're supporting, what's the best way to, 
to make noise in a, in that professional way to to make sure that the changes happen. And do you feel like there's something that like an example of something that you're that brings you to that question? Every job that I've had within the human services field, if I ask questions or if I, you know, wonder why we do things a certain way, it's always kind of like, oh, don't don't touch on that. Don't talk about that. Right. Like, um, so I don't know if that that might just be a matter of um, I've had someone say you need to build some clout before you can ask those questions. Um, yeah. I think for me, it's always about the team. You know, if you have a concern, someone else likely has a similar concern. And so then discussing that with other people to kind of gauge your, you know, your concern and its sentiment within the workforce. And usually that's uh, where I would start. And then, of course, always with your relationship with your supervisor, who it should, you know, should be there to give you some feedback. I mean, there some people really do feel like if they speak up, that they are creating a problem. Mm -hmm. But, you know, is speaking up is one way to look at it, another way to consider what you're doing is improving um, the way the team functions and seeing it from that perspective kind of brings it to where it belongs within the organization. I think there's also um, ways to speak up with kindness that doesn't feel like this is what's wrong. But in from a helpful angle of it could be better if, or I could help by, or I was wondering, um, and coming at uh, this could be better, or this would be more helpful. Um, and I feel like a lot of companies always ask for feedback, or they'll say, this is a space where you can bring your concerns to me. And people don't, <laughs> they don't show up for those. So that's a place where, where they're inviting you to come with the criticisms and solutions and suggestions. And, and whenever you get those opportunities, you should show up for them and you should show up with um, your, your complaints, but also ways that you can help or the ways that it could be better and be open to some pushback and having a dialogue and conversation about it instead of saying, oh, they said no, so I'm not gonna talk about it anymore. Because I think, when they're saying, bring me your feedback, they really want to hear. And whether that change happens that week, that month, it probably is not going to be that fast. But the less, the more people speak up and the more people do it with kindness, the more they'll be willing to listen. Um, and it can be really discouraging when you keep doing this and then you get coined as a troublemaker. And then, of course, you don't want to speak up anymore. But this is why the new graduates coming in is so important because I feel like people who've been in this field longer put up with a lot more and we need to keep talking about it and we need to keep proposing changes. So it's important to keep doing it. Great question, Nicole, and thank you, Veronica and Lisa. Any more questions? I know there's one from the chat. Um, I will read it from Joy. How to get back into the field after being gone for so long? So any tips on, I guess, how to get back into the field after not being in it for a while? Um, I think maybe if you have the opportunity or the means, um, maybe taking a couple courses at a college, like that could help you maybe network and find opportunities. Um, you know, if you have the ability to do that, taking a couple courses and in, in what you want to get back into. And then, you know, you'd meet professors and other people there that 
you could not work with. I took some time away from the workforce to have my children and to do some other things. And so coming back into it, one of the things that I did was start to call people that I used to work with. And so that um, just reopening up those networks and then volunteering. And one of the beauties of social work is that it's such a broad field. So you really can come at it from multiple angles. And so if you know, you can attack it from, from that way to get yourself back in. Yeah, I love that. I feel like there's so many opportunities to kind of enter. I'm entering from a professional communications background, but I went back to school. I think there were opportunities to volunteer, like you mentioned, um, join things like this, you know, meeting new people, putting your email in the chat, <laughs> LinkedIn, things like that. So thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Please feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, um, I will pass it. I had a question I put in the chat. Maybe it didn't oh, reach sorry, it. Peggy. No, that's okay. Um, I hit enter, so I just assumed it went. It was... Anyway, um, I graduated and took the exam and went back to my field placement and I wanted to do therapy and they um, were ready to hire me, but the health insurance companies told them that they would not commit to reimbursing for my title, which of course, um, I was like totally flabbergasted by that. I didn't understand it because they have an LMHC that works there. And of course, LCSWs are fine. Um, and the LMHC does, there's no issue. But the health insurance company said, oh, we need proof that she's working in a field that's necessary <laughs> in mental health, which is like, you know, an oxymoron to say that. But in any event, um, I talked to people at um, Office of the Professions and State Ed, and the person who wrote the legislation, um, the new legislation for LMHCs to be able to do what we do, which is assess and provide therapy and things like that. Um, they're not supposed to be able to do those things without supervision, but for some reason they're being seen as independent. So all of the remote places, I had a list of 20 remote companies, you know, like Headspace and that kind of thing. And um, they're all looking for like all the other jobs, LMHCs, and LMFTs and LCSWs and LMSWs are left off of every single job. And I've been getting, you know, LinkedIn, I've been getting um, Indeed. I, this is even before I graduated in January of 22, I started getting them and I started asking my teachers, how come, you know, there's nothing for LMSWs or, you know, why is it all LMHCs? Because my, my I thought that, you know, our work was, we had to, um, it was more intense, our program, because the college I went to actually taught both, teaches both programs. Um, we weren't told there was going to be any kind of an issue like this. And I did have a, a meeting with my old teacher. And I guess the whole legislation about the LMHCs has just provided a lot of foggy area. So I can't find a job. <laughs> as an LMSW in therapy, and I don't know how, I, there's no other way for me to get my LCSW if I don't, you know, get a job in therapy and find a supervisor and clock my hours. And you need 2000 clinical hours, you need a hundred and whatever supervision. Somebody was at that company where, or the agency where I was, was willing to supervise me, but they take insurance and they said, we can't, if, they won't promise us they'll reimburse us for you, then we can't hire you. So I've been looking ever since, and I've been trying to find out why this is happening. And I, I just kind of got ghosted because even the guy that helped write the legislation for LMHCs was saying, there's got to be jobs out there for you because LMHCs are supposed to be supervised just like you. 
you know, this legislation isn't supposed to be passed, you know, until January, they're supposed to have to go back to school, take additional credits and all this other stuff. But they're still in demand, LMHCs. So they are being seen as independent for some reason and um, LMSWs are not. So I don't know, Lisa, if you you would probably know a little bit more about the therapy world, but um, I haven't been able to find one one thing or one person that will answer the question of why health insurances are even saying this. Wow, that sounds really hard. I'm sorry you're going through that. Oh, thank um, you. I know I'm not really sure all the nitty gritty um, insurance details, but as a LMSW, you, all of your notes, all of your sessions get supervised and your LCSW signs off on those notes, which means effectively it gets billed under their license. So you have to find a, probably a community mental health clinic who are willing to take LMSWs um, to get those hours. And that's probably going to be our best bet. Um, I don't know where you live, but if you just Google community mental health, that's a good place to start. Um, and you really, you should be able to find LMSW positions, at least in person. I know remote jobs are going to be really challenging, but in person and hybrid shouldn't be this, this difficult. Um, but yeah. I don't want to provide supervision. Right. So and most community mental health clinics do, because that's how that they, they get a lot of the therapists in the door because it's no, really changing work and they need they need a lot of LMSWs to um, serve the community. But yeah, remote work with the LMSW is a lot is a lot more challenging. Um, you're going to have a much easier time finding in-person positions. Are you having any luck with in-person no, I, I've been looking since January 22. And the other issue too is um, I'm looking for part-time, not full-time. And I have six years or anybody has six years to get their LCSW. Mm -hmm. like, so working part-time shouldn't be an issue, but I was offered a job with a kidney um, dialysis center, but they wouldn't provide me supervision if I wasn't going to be full-time. Mm. So even though it doesn't matter, you have six years, um, it, you know. Yeah, I know there's so many restrictions around it. It's challenging. Yeah, but anyway. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Elisa. I think Thank we have you. a couple more questions in the chat. One is, and forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, Yael. Um, how do we hold organizations accountable to increase pay? Anyone have any advice on that one? <laughs> I know it's a hot topic for sure. Um. I mean, I think in, in annual reviews, you can prepare for them and come to the table with what you bring to the company and what you've learned in the past year and come with a figure, you know, an increase that you're asking for and probably go higher than you really want because they're probably going to go lower. Um, I'm lucky in that the company I work for gives automatic increases every year to everybody. So um, I don't really have to have that conversation. Um, but in my previous job I did, and that's, you know, how I approached it was to come to the table with everything I'd done in the past year and what I'd learned and why I thought I deserved, um, a raise. And to that also, um, Pilar had asked, how do we negotiate salary so that we're not being exploited, which is a similar question, um. But if any Veronica or Elisa have any comments? Yeah, I just I just want to throw come at it from uh, the legislative perspective. So there's as Jamie said, right? You have a conversation, you really demonstrate what you bring to the table, your value and your worth. But what social workers do is so uh, determined by what the state values as your work, not your organization. Right, because much of what we do is contracted work. 
So if that's true of reimbursement, right? And that's true of uh, the, especially prevention education type work that we do in social work. So this, that's where advocacy and legislative advocacy becomes so important because we really need to always be out there telling the state, look, your contract for this, for this important work for childcare, for substance abuse intervention can't be $10, $12 an hour. It's got to be worth more than that. And so we've always got to be out there talking about the value of, of our work and also forcing government to acknowledge the value of their work through how they pay our agencies, how they pay nonprofit organizations for the contractual services that they have absolved the state of doing, essentially. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that perspective. It's good to get <laughs> both sides. Um, anyone else have any questions? Um, we will also, I believe each panelist would uh, be open to sharing their contact information in the chat. Um, so I will pass it to Maine. Yeah. Um feel free to, everyone feel free to say in the chat about any comments or your takeaway from this panel. And also feel free to share your uh, professional network contact information. And yeah, thank you to all the panelists tonight. It's been truly inspiring to learn about your pathway to the field of social work you're doing and to see how how big the field is and with so many opportunities in different um, sectors and different level of social work. Um, and thank you our social worker, fellow social workers and students for joining us on a busy Monday night where we thank for your time. We hope you were able to gain some insight from this event and hope to see you in the future uh, for our chapter chat panel events. Um, our next panel for this um, Siri will be on May 1st, um, and we we also invited um, other social workers from other fields to join the panel discussion. Um, please look out for a follow-up survey in your email. We want to know about your thoughts and feedback about tonight's event and how to improve it and to build on our future events. And with that being said, um, if anyone doesn't have any questions, we will um, close this panel and thank you everyone for your time. And thank you, Veronica, Jimmy, and Elisa so much for your time and sharing your, your insights and skills. It's, it's wonderful hearing from you all, so thank you. We can do a virtual applause to everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you.